Hey there, I'm your host, T.G. Brandfault, and you are listening to the Gondrepreneur.com podcast, where we try to bring you actionable information and normalize cannabis through the stories of gondrepreneurs, activists, and industry stakeholders. Today, I'm joined by Ryan Smith. He's the CEO and co-founder of LeafLink, which provides a wholesale management platform for the cannabis industry. In 2016, Smith was included in the Forbes 30 under 30 list. Uh, so he doesn't really need my introduction. Uh, but how are you doing this afternoon, Ryan? Great. Thanks, TJ, for having uh, having me and LeafLink on the podcast today. I'm really excited. You know, we have a, we have a lot to cover. Uh, but before we get into sort of the nuts and bolts, man, tell me about yourself. You know, what's your background? How'd you end up in the cannabis space? My so grew up in New York City, uh, in Manhattan, and uh, always on the East Coast. Went to school on the East Coast and started an investor relationship management platform for real estate companies back in college as an undergrad. Uh, we exited that to a public company in 2014, and then. Um, I've always been selling stuff on eBay in my free time. So my parents had a joke that if things like would go missing in the house, they were probably in Ryan's PayPal account. So I always loved marketplace technology. And we thought there's a really unique opportunity to empower companies in the cannabis industry because it's so new. It's defining itself every day that if we could build tech in from the very beginning, like what does that mean for an industry that's going to be and is getting to be as big as it is? Uh, so that's when Zach and my, my co-founder, Zach, and I connected and began just doing research and hearing what people needed to help grow their businesses. And that's what gave birth to LeafLink. So why don't you describe uh, to the listeners what LeafLink is and, and what sets it apart uh, tech-wise you know, from, from other competitors? So LeafLink is a wholesale B2B marketplace, right? We have tools that support those business to business transactions. And then we enable and empower companies to buy the products they normally buy faster and then also find new ones. Cause as you know, there's a new company every morning and night in this industry and to keep track of those and their prices and their mission is difficult. Um, and so LeafLink is, there's really two differences. The first is our team. So we have brought together a mixture of people that have incredible cannabis experience, have been op working at retail locations, have worked for distributors, have worked for brands. And then we've also married those skill sets with people that would never be in the cannabis industry if they weren't at LeafLink. Incredible engineers, people with great experience working at companies like Yelp or other tech leaders um, that you know, you'd recognize. And so those two skill sets together is a, is a clear advantage. The second is our community. So we have over 2000 retailers and almost 500 brands now that are active on the platform every day in six states. And so what we're doing, and we've always said in the very beginning, our focus is to create a new standard in this industry, uh, define it from the beginning and how people not only communicate with each other, but also transact uh, wholesale with each other. And so that entire acceptance product fit community that we've built, we think is the second clear differentiator that makes us powerful and in a good position to continue to grow, which we still have a lot of growth to do. So you mentioned uh, people first, you know, what do you look for in, in bringing in this talent? You say you necessarily, you know, find people who, who, are, who weren't active in this space. So, so, you know, what qualities do you look for in, in people that you bring in? Execution, professionalism are, I think, two of the, the biggest ones. We've seen, you know, like everyone says in this industry, one year is like seven years. The same things happen, like it just moves so quickly. And if you even look at articles of tech companies two or three years ago, some of which are not even really around anymore, there was this whole branding and, and cultural story around, oh, you know, this is a tech company for marijuana. People get high there at work and they have a dab room. And, and, and for us, and Zach and I have always thought that this industry deserves just as great software, just as incredible and skilled people working on their teams. And, and they deserve that same standard from us. So from the very beginning, we wanted to bring in people that if you have industry experience, amazing, but we do see this second step, this new level of maturity that the whole industry is entering. And we want to do everything we can to further that because that's how this industry goes as mainstream and becomes commercialized and just everywhere. Uh, there just aren't enough people that have cannabis experience to, to fill the 
positions. And so bringing in talented, skilled people to further that goal is something we've been always super focused on and, and think of ourselves, you know, as a tech company looking for incredibly professional and skilled people that execute, get stuff done facing the cannabis industry. Do people that, that you might approach, uh, do they ever give you the side eye, you know, because you're in the cannabis industry, you know, is, is that stigma still persistent? I, I like almost laugh because I would laugh at someone if they, if they have that, but what we've, but what we've seen so much more now we've had, we've gone through three rounds of funding is there is such a deep interest in companies that either they're institutional capital looking for opportunities, or they're just, you know, some of the people we have, one of our first angel investors was a, a teacher at a Catholic school, you know, one of a friends and family and wrote a, wrote a small check, but albeit a check. And there's this openness that we're seeing now that that look, that look doesn't happen really as much as we think anymore. And part of what we were just talking about before and things that you're seeing and some of the people you've even had on this podcast before, like that, that next level of, of, um, of professionalism is coming to the space and it's becoming as it should be treated as though it's any other with the same, everything that ever, you know, that people take for granted in other industries. So it doesn't happen as often as it does. And if it, and if it does happen, it's clearly not a good person for us to be speaking with because there have a clearly antiquated way of seeing reality. So you had mentioned, you know, your successful fundraising round. Um, what has led to that success, especially in this era of uncertainty given federal policy? Startups are always risky, right? Like there's, you know, whatever, 80% of them fail. And, and then, then when you think about startups in this industry, that's a startup itself, it's even crazier. And I think a lot of people in the space, when they're used to, when they're looking at deals, there are, you can name half a dozen companies that get a lot of press, seem really exciting, seemingly say the right things, but then the truth shakes out, right? Who is getting stuff done? Who's moving forward? Who's achieving their goals, surpassing their goals? And who's just talking a lot? And what we've built at LeafLink and what we're going to always continue to push ourselves to build is a company that does deliver and does complete the things that we say and promise to our clients, to the community, to our investors, to our team that we're going to do. And that really goes a long way. So if you can create some level, and by the way, there's still a ton of risk and it's, we are still startup and have a lot to do, but when you begin to mitigate some of that risk by doing what you said you were going to do six months ago, and maybe even doing a better job with it, you begin to build that trust with people. And, and that's, that's really what we've done it in like a very high level. So you said earlier, you're operating in six States. Um, you know, and, and as you said, I mean, this industry is moving at a breakneck pace. You know, we see every day an, another potential medical program, you know, uh, you see states like where I'm at in Vermont and, and these sort of mm -hmm. gray markets that start to emerge, um, which obviously isn't, isn't a market that you would operate in because there's really no infrastructure. But how do you identify which markets to enter and which ones not to enter? So you're right that Vermont is not a market for us right now. There's not going to be, as far as we know, any retail locations or commercialized brands with CPG items that they're, you know, packaged consumer goods that they're going to be uh, selling. But what we do think, but that's positive, but it's still positive, right? It's the right direction. It's positive momentum for people to become more familiar with, see how the industry is growing, see the potential that's there. And then maybe two or three years on the road, it, it, it advances and matures in a, in, a, in a way that will become interesting to us. For us at LeafLink, though, the markets that make the most sense in the first market um, that we launched in, and they usually mimic something similar to the Colorado uh, regulatory design. So usually states start with vertical integration, right? You have to own the land where it's grown, the, the factory where it's made, the store where it's sold. Um, and then more licenses are given out. People begin, begin to be allowed to specialize in who's an amazing retailer, who's a rock star brand, who can do an incredible job with logistics. And then people begin to specialize in just that thing. And those are the markets that the ones that are not vertically integrated. So for us, it doesn't really matter if it's medical or recreational. It matters more that there's a free market with a licensing structure that lets companies do one thing very well. And then they can all connect to the community on LeafLink and do deals with each other. But um, those are the ones that we we target the most. And the states that we're live in right now are first it was Colorado, then Washington, then Oregon, California, Nevada, and Arizona. So Arizona being an example that's medical, 
but uh, companies are allowed to specialize. It's not vertically integrated, and it's been a, a great fit for us there so far. And you'd mentioned brands, and man, I can't tell you how many emails I get of, of brands, and then, and then a few weeks later, they're gone. Right. So, so how do you identify the brand that, that you guys are going to offer? We've been trying, and this is something that we can definitely, and are always trying to improve, but qualifying participants and members of LeafLink, LeafLink's community is, is, is challenging because in certain states, right, it could be, let's say if, if a state only has 70 retail locations, if they're in 50, that's amazing, right? They have great market penetration. They're clearly a company that's doing business, they're fit. But then in some other states, if you have only 25 or 30 dispensaries or retailers on, on your, in your sales book, you're, you're just getting started, right? And so we, we see a lot of companies come out really loud. They want to get on LeafLink. They think that they're going to put their stuff up on the platform. They may not have a sales team. They may not even have a finished product or an ad advertising strategy or really any clients. And they expect that magically, you know, it's cannabis. Everyone's making so much money and we're going to do a bunch of sales and here we go, eight figures in revenue. And then it doesn't happen. And then they, yeah, they kind of teeter out. And, and so it's, there's, we're trying to be as objective as we can when we qualify leads and prospects, but it's tough. And, and there's a, there's a level of subjectivity to like just talking to the other side of the marketplace who's, which, which retailers are excited about certain brands, which purchasing managers want to buy and sample certain items, but it's, it's tough and it, it's changing quickly. So what, what trends are, are you seeing? You know, I, I've seen a lot about uh, the plummet of, of flower sales while concentrates are, are, you know, taking over the market. And I've heard the same thing about edibles, um, you know, that, that, you know, flowers dying and, and that whole thing. What, what trends are you seeing in terms of product? Is, is this, you know, flower dying narrative accurate? Uh, well, of course not, right? Well, it is, I'd say it is as a business that anyone can access, but of course it's not as a very, as the key raw ingredient, right? So there'll always be a market for flour, but the people that are, have the ability to grow it. So let's say two or three years ago, you could, you and I could get together and have a 15, 20,000 square foot facility, grow uh, loose flour and sell it. And that would be a good business. But what we're seeing is that that's becoming increasingly more difficult as the price continues to drop. I mean, in, even in Oregon right now, there's like, it's just rock bottom prices. And so uh, what we think is going to happen, and we're seeing more of this, is that there are going to be mass massive operations at scale, high volume production facilities that will be able to make money, but only because they're moving such a high amount of product at a, at a very tight margin, kind of like a paper company um, that will still be a business. But what we're seeing, the reason why concentrates are exploding is because people that were previously growing flour can't make real money on flour. So they turn it into a concentrate, brand it, put it in a package, and then there's usually a higher margin on that. And our bet at LeafLink and what we see happening, what we see happening in all of these states as they mature, uh, is that the edibles packaged branded goods are clearly the future, right? I mean, there's just all of these new companies that are starting in the space need a mission, need a brand, need something that a buyer and end consumer can relate to and can understand. And it's hard for you know, most demographics to understand the differences between all the different, you know, strains, but it's easier to understand a cream that I've seen before that looks like it's made from, you know, a vino or something similar and by that have that connection. So I think brands are the future. Flour will always have its place, but, um, but raw flour will continue to drop in pricing as we, as we're seeing in every single market, you know? That's really, really interesting stuff, man. Um, I want to talk to you a bit more, um, about sort of sort of uh, what we're seeing on a federal level uh, but before we do that we got to take a break this is entrepreneur.com podcast i'm tg Grandfall. If you are looking for a job in the rapidly growing and highly competitive cannabis industry, Gontrepreneur.com is the place to look. Visit the Gontrepreneur job board today to browse current openings with cannabis companies throughout the United States, from entry-level bud tender positions to executive-level career opportunities. You can also create a profile and upload your resume to be discovered by cannabis recruiters. Visit our job board at jobs.gontrepreneur.com to create your profile today. 
If you are a business owner, you can post your job openings for as little as $25 on our job board to reach the largest and most engaged audience of cannabis professionals on the web. Companies who are listed in the Gondrepreneur Business Directory are eligible for free job listings. If you are already signed up, contact us today via the website or send us an email at grow at gondrepreneur.com to activate your unique coupon. Hey there, welcome back to the Gondrepreneur.com podcast. I'm your host, T.G. Brandfault, here with Ryan Smith, CEO and co-founder of Leith Flink. Super, super smart guy. Really, really stoked to have you on the show, man. Um, so in, in a December 2016 Marijuana Business Daily article, you said that you were in the wait and see camp regarding Trump's cannabis policy. Um, you know, on the campaign trail, he had said that, you know, it was a state's rights decision. And we can, you know, now he's saying that all drug dealers should be murdered. Um, that was more than a year before the Cole memo was rescinded by Jeff Sessions. Um, how do you feel now, more than a year later, about this administration as it relates to cannabis policy? Are you still in that wait and see camp? A lot of feelings, for sure, about, you know, what's happening in D.C., but I think we are still in the wait and see, right? I mean, if you look at what's changed, no new laws have been enacted at a federal level. No new laws have changed. There's been a press conference and the rescinding of the Cole memo, which wasn't law either and was really just a guidance from, from a federal agency to each of the state district attorneys to give them guidance. And the response that we've seen, I think even since that that announcement was made by Sessions is you, the federal government is beginning to force people to make a decision, right? So immediately after Jeff Sessions had that coal rescinding action that he did, uh, Vermont and New Hampshire come online, you know? And then it's like, if you're going to force people to make a decision on legalization, we know the vast majority of people, regardless of party, regardless of demographic, regardless of territory, are in favor of, legal, of legalizing marijuana. And if, and that's just the, the way we continue to move. So I think there hasn't been any, there hasn't been any federal changes for us to react to really. And if there are, then we will think hard about those. We want to be compliant. We spend a ton of time at LeafLink understanding and with lawyers to just un, to have a, a good comprehension of what is developing compliance wise, regulatory wise in each state. Uh, and we'll do the same once there's something to follow and, and, Go, guidelines to go through with the by the federal government. It just seems like there's so much changing so quickly, and until there's a, a real announcement or a real enforcement action, not much for us to, to really do right now. Other than keep the keep the pace and continue with the momentum that we have in building our company and and the 30 people that we have on staff that work so hard every day to make LeafLink real. So what what do you think, man? Would happen if they were to start cracking down. You operate in six states, so, so I mean, you have a really good look at a large portion of this market. I mean, I mean, what would what ramifications would that have, like on the ground, literally, to to stakeholders now? Fear. I think that that's and that would be to me the mo behind any kind of enforcement action from the federal level, right? It would. It's just not, so we're, we're a technology company, right? We don't touch the product. We don't touch the money. We're just a software provider to the industry. But if something like that happened, it would definitely spook some investors. It would, but then you have other people that are running companies too, right? Brands that are in multiple states that are employing hundreds of people, retail locations that have patients that rely on them every single day. People that are really, I mean, this is a part of their life. It's they're super passionate about it. It's not, it's more than just a living. And, and I don't think that's going to change. So the lives will change of, you know, anyone that enforcement that the enforcement acts against, of course, but, but for the whole market to take something down, that's this large and growing faster than almost any other industry, really hard to do. I think fear would be the number one thing. Maybe it would dry up capital coming into the space uh, from more institutional, traditionally minded investors, but but long term, I think the die's already really been cast on the potential here and and just general societal acceptance. I mean, we 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 can hope at this point. But sometimes I have no idea what's going on in DC. Um, most of the time, sometimes. <laughs> um, so so sort of looking, you know, into your into your crystal ball. I mean, we got we got Maine. That's that's pretty close. You know, th there might be some setbacks because of LePage and and some of the the 
lawmakers there who really want to push it back. Uh, Massachusetts is still set on that July 1st date. Uh, there, we could be looking at social use in Alaska. Um, so, so there's changes happening um, within the market that already exists and some policy changes that, that you know, are, are the result of 2016 referendum. Uh, in your opinion, you know, looking through a crystal ball, man, which states do you think might be next to turn green? So I could say which ones that we're most excited about that fit for, for LeafLink. Um, I think Michigan and New Jersey this year are really exciting. Very populous states, obviously not quite the size of of uh, California, which is what everyone you know is regularly talking about. I'm actually you know, calling from LA this week. Um, but I th those two states are most interesting to me because what has, if you look at a map, the whole West Coast is in line, right? The legalized challenges, of course, but industry booming. You look at the West, the, look at the West Coast. That's what that was for. On the East Coast, there, there are states that have legalized. They're they're really not super active market or they're in this weird in-between, kind of putting their foot in the water. I think as soon as Massachusetts starts opening up some doors, New Jersey particularly being right next to New York, I mean, Cuomo and New York already put, a, put together a commission to give him a report on the effect of legalizing marijuana because they know all of these super populous border states to New Jersey, to Michigan, Michigan being in the middle, New Jersey being on the East Coast, it will create this domino effect, I think. And so those are the ones that we're most excited about. When you have people in New York going to Hoboken to buy marijuana, New York State's going to say, this is ridiculous. We should have the same accessibility for patients and buyers here. And then that, and then that state turns. Uh, some of the states that we're, that we're looking at too, obviously Pennsylvania, Illinois, Alaska, you mentioned, um, and Ohio. There's a few other smaller states that we're looking at, but, but our goal at LeafLink is to open up in, um, we're in six states now, so to be in 15 by the end of the year. Some of them are very much like Q3, Q4, but um, th those Michigan and, and Pennsylvania really seem to be a before the summer activity for us to launch there, so we're keeping our eye on those. So I, I covered the New York State Legislature uh, for several years before I started writing about cannabis. And, um, you know, one of the things I've always said is, is Cuomo won't let this happen on his watch uh, for a lot of different reasons. Uh, so as somebody else from New York, do you get that? Did, did you get that same feeling before he put together that commission? And do you think that he will actually allow this to happen, you know, as, as sort of a centrist Democrat? All of these, all of these elected officials. So Cuomo was so incredibly against it. I mean, you know, his father being in like Rockefeller drug New York days, right? There's like that obviously trickles down. And then all of these elected officials are realizing, even though Cuomo was such a, so against legalization and even like medical usage several years ago, it's clearly a losing position. And Every election, it seems like this issue is going to be coming up more and more, and they are not blind to that. At the midterm elections, I think it's going to be a huge issue. People are going to talk about it all the time. The same way the governor, the current governor of New Jersey, promised, you know, first 100 days. I don't know if that's going to happen, but it was a point to discuss, and that will continue to build up steam. So I would have said two years ago, Cuomo probably wants to run for president or some other more senior office. So this issue is kind of not a done deal on if there's a majority of people that are in support of it. But now that that's beginning to happen, it would be ill-advised for him not to at least explore it. So him having a commission is perfect, right? He could say, I set the thing, I set the things in motion for us to look at it as a state. Maybe it won't, nothing you know, significant will happen in New York while he's in office, but he could always go back and say, but I began it. These things take time. You know what I mean? And, and but he could also say, I never changed anything and I didn't make anything opened up. So it's like he's playing both sides, but but that's even that's a positive momentum, right? Like before, there wasn't it wasn't trying to play both sides. It was just you know I'm against this. I mean, it's really frustrating as you know somebody who went to school in Albany and, and you know in a very liberal part of the state, knowing you know that the rural part of the state is just hemorrhaging money, that there's no jobs, and that this is something that you know that farmland that's that's how you use that farmland. You know, even even a proper hemp program for that matter. Um, so. You know, it's it, it's really interesting for me to sort of watch you know, my home state 
or my, my ex home state, I guess, uh, inch towards it, but knowing what I know about Cuomo and having covered him for so long. Um, I want to talk to you about your, your sort of personal success. Uh, but before we do that, we got to take a break. This is the Entrepreneur.com podcast from TG Brandfall. At Gontrepreneur, we have heard from dozens of cannabis business owners who have encountered the issue of canna bias, which is when a mainstream business, whether a landlord, bank, or some other provider of vital business services, refuses to do business with them simply because of their association with cannabis. We have even heard stories of businesses being unable to provide health and life insurance for their employees because the insurance providers were too afraid to work with them. We believe that this fear is totally unreasonable and that cannabis business owners deserve access to the same services and resources that other businesses are afforded, that they should be able to hire consultation to help them follow the letter of the law in their business endeavors, and that they should be able to provide employee benefits without needing to compromise on the quality of coverage they can offer. This is why we created the Gondrepreneur.com Business Service Directory, a resource for cannabis professionals to find and connect with service providers who are cannabis friendly and who are actively seeking cannabis industry clients. If you are considering hiring a business consultant, lawyer, accountant, web designer, or any other ancillary service for your business, go to Gondrepreneur.com slash businesses to browse hundreds of agencies, firms, and organizations who support cannabis legalization and who want to help you grow your business. With so many options to choose from in each service category, you will be able to browse company profiles and do research on multiple companies in advance so you can find the provider who is the best fit for your particular need. Our business service directory is intended to be a useful and well-maintained resource, which is why we individually vet each listing that is submitted. If you are a business service provider who wants to work with cannabis clients, you may be a good fit for our service directory. Go to gondrepreneur.com slash businesses to create your profile and start connecting with cannabis entrepreneurs today. Hey, welcome back to the Gondrepreneur.com podcast. I'm your host, TG Brandfault, here with Ryan Smith, CEO and co-founder of LeafLink. Um, so what man do you credit your personal success to, such as being named uh, to Forbes as one of the 30 under 30 in the emerging tech space? I mean, that's super cool, man. Um, you know, what do you credit that to? Uh, I feel like I have to say like execution again. I mean, I the first, the, I have trouble with the question of like, being like crediting success because that implies that, that we have some success in my mind we're just getting started and haven't really accomplished all that much yet there's way more in front of us than behind so i mean i appreciate the compliment and everything uh but yeah there's you know I don't, I don't feel that successful so we you know, have way more to do before i <laughs> could sit back and get comfy that way but when 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 you know forbes reaches out to you and tells you this what what was sort of going through your mind did, did you think maybe at that point like you're closer to making it well the first thing that comes to my mind is great i could now be in a group of other people that are thinking similarly or trying to do challenging exciting things and and see what happens you know from those kinds of relationships and it is cool to be on those lists because there's not very many aside from like taking a company public or having some great acquisition awards for entrepreneurs so it's definitely an honor to be on it and, and very excited about it i was excited too for LeafLink and the company to be on the first cannabis firm, cannabis facing firm to be on that list is huge for mainstreaming, just how everyone thinks about this industry. And, and uh, so we're, yeah, we're happy about it. And obviously honored to be on that list and the fast company list we were on last week, but, but still so much more ahead of us. So what advice do you have for entrepreneurs looking to enter this space? I mean, it, it, from, from a tech perspective, especially meet more people so everyone knows that the industry is everyone knows it's a hot industry that it's real that it's growing very quickly but to to go to the to states where it's legal to spend time with the incredible entrepreneurs there that are building these amazing companies and just realize that they have there are, there are serious challenges that are presented to all business owners but but particularly in this space there are so many opportunities to serve them with great technology, with great services, with great solutions. And so if you want to get into the space, I mean, I do what I do again, what Zach and I did. We flew out to Colorado. We emailed a bunch of people and whoever agreed to meet with us, we sat down with them and then built a relationship and we were helping 
you know, helping people pack boxes and going on sales calls just to get what they do and understand the industry. So really, if you want to know more, dive in and, and meet more people, really. In, like in person, meet more people, you know. How nerve wracking is that, man? Like, like I'm, you know, I, I don't go to conferences. I'm a, I'm a very, very private person. And, you know, so, so, you know, how nerve wracking is it being a startup and, and reaching out to people sort of cold calling them to, to get their opinion on, on what you're selling? Like, like how, how, what goes through your head? Two things. First is they'll, if I, if I keep my promise or my intention behind meeting them, their life should be a little bit better from the solution that we've created. And the second is you need to like part, you got to rev yourself up. You know what I mean? So sometimes we'll go in, I'll go into a meeting and my, my first thought before sitting down is this is going to be an awesome get together. We're going to learn a bunch of things and the other side of this meeting. So you can either go in being nervous or you could say, you know what? The other side of this meeting is going to one day say they had a meeting with LeafLink when we were two people or we were three people and there was like, nah, no way. And and whether or not that's the case, you need to like rev yourself up. And so that's just one of the you know tricks that I do. I know our team does and we want to help people, but you need to also be excited to put yourself out there because it's the only way you get things done. This has been really a, a super cool conversation, man. I, I'm really stoked that you could take the time out uh, to join me on the show. Where can people find out more about you? Where can they find out more about LeafLink? Yeah, if you're, well, thank you, by the way, TJ, for having us. Really uh, always loved Entrepreneur and glad we could, you know, chat on all these things. If you want to find out more about LeafLink, uh, you can visit us at leaflink.com. If you're a retail dispensary, you know, we'd love to have you on the community with the 2,000 others that are really active in the six states that we're currently live in, much more to come. And if you're a brand, same thing, go to leaflink.com. If you're looking for work, we're hiring actively after our most recent raise. So send resumes to jobs at leaflink.com. Otherwise, happy to walk you guys through any kind of demo. If you send an email to sales at leaflink.com and set it up there. Well, again, man, thank you so much. Uh, it's, it's really nice to, to, to chat with you, um, p pick your brain a whole lot. Um, and fellow New Yorker too, I, I don't get too many of those on the show. So, uh, you know, I mean, congratulations, you know, you're, you're a humble guy, obviously, uh, but congratulations on all your personal success, success thus far, as, as well as the success of LeafLink, man. It's super cool stuff. Thank you for, you know, appreciate all those kind words and, you know, happy to chat more at another time. Looking forward to it, man. You can find more episodes of the Gontrepreneur.com podcast in the podcast section of Gontrepreneur.com and in the Apple iTunes store. On the Gontrepreneur.com website, you will find the latest cannabis news and cannabis jobs updated daily along with transcripts of this podcast. You can also download the Gontrepreneur.com app in iTunes and Google Play. This episode was engineered by Trim Media House. I've been your host, TG Brandfault.